So this is uh, challenging cases and newly diagnosed hormone sensitive metastatic uh, prostate cancer. My disclosures are here. Um, we're going to evaluate. These are the goals here. But the rules are, the discussants have been told this, they have two, two slides maximum in two minutes, okay? So uh, I want the timer to run for us back there so we could get, in, get done in time to hear Greg and, uh, and the Eagles band play. So let's go over this case. This is a 58-year-old uh, engineer who was told by his family practitioner seven years ago not to have a PSA screening test. Sound familiar? Fam he has family history of prostate cancers. 18 months ago, he noticed some increased frequency of urination and decrease in the stream. He was started on Tamsulosin Flomax without much effect. Eight months later, he had persistent low back pain, and his chiropractor ordered a PSA. It was 267. Biopsies were done. He had uh, grade group three and four, and the technetium bone scan was positive, both in the api uh, uh, axial and appendicular skeleton. So, Greg, uh, I was uh, wondering if you could comment on this. Uh, one of the things that uh, I'd be concerned about is that there's not enough information. I mean, if a, he said seven years ago that he didn't need to have uh, an examination, and uh, he continued to treat him and never changed that opinion and never advised him otherwise, then I think there would be some substantial exposure. Even though uh, the, uh, there are clinical guidelines, uh, practice guidelines that uh, suggest that you don't need uh, a screening at that age, given the family history and everything else, I, I think there's a, a level of exposure here. I, I think where everybody's sort of split. Um, what, what do you think, uh, Neil? So, yeah, uh, of course, uh, uh, <laughs> reflexive, I'm not a lawyer, but, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, you, when somebody comes in and they have symptomatology, uh, but they can hide behind the, uh, the USPSTF, uh, you know, uh, savings. And we talked about this earlier today. They, people can hide, and the American Academy of Family Physicians says, don't check a PSA. So it depends on the timing, though, because you know, they went from a, an, an I to a D to a C. Um, I, I think it's very concerning, which is why we have challenges with guidelines. But as Jim Moeller said, they're not rules, they're guidelines. And I think that's a, you know, a really important aspect to all guidelines. So for all of us, we'd want, we would have wanted to have had a PSA, without a doubt. One other thing, in, you know, the, I think the 1917 or 2017 changes to the guidelines uh, require or suggest that you have some kind of a conference with the client and, uh, and go through the options uh, before you make those kinds yeah. of uh, decisions. Not so to, uh, so the, guidelines don't, uh, the guidelines don't take you off the hook. Right. One last comment, we're going to move on. Just my understanding is that where experts disagree, you have very tenuous case for a lawsuit. And there's clearly disagreement amongst experts, maybe not the experts who are here, but across the country, uh, you know, there's disagreement about this. It's still controversial. I, I don't think there's any way this would be a successful lawsuit. Well, I, I know about three of them going on right now that I've been in Florida that I'm yeah, involved and, with. And, and furthermore, though, how do you know, even if he did get a PSA, whenever he had the first Someone's opportunity to get it, that that would have allowed you to find it non-metastatic and curable? You know, yeah. you don't know that. It's speculative. That's an argument many times, but, you know, this was seven years ago when he laid, the, you know, laid down the rules, no, no screening. Okay, so only a bone scan was performed, uh, and, and Tom sort of discussed this in his case. Would you order more imaging tests? Um, and uh, so let's ask everybody. Only a bone scan was performed. Would you perform a CT scan, uh, next generation imaging, multiparametric MRI, or do nothing further? I don't think I'd do any more. I mean, we know the diagnosis. We know he has high volume metastatic disease. Okay. So every, everybody wants to do a CT scan, uh, which is sort of what people do. I agree with you. I think it's probably a waste of time. Jerry, it's your turn. Do I get my two slides? Yeah, we'll get them up for you. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think we, we talked about it uh, in Tom's uh, earlier session. So here's a meta-analysis of uh, uh, like 3,800 articles on uh, PET scans, choline PET, sodium fluoride PET, 
MRI and bone scans to identify and uh, count the number of bone metastases. And you can see uh, that uh, bone scan all the way to the right, sensitivity of only 0 0.68, bottom uh, row there. And you can see as you move to the left, now uh, uh, sodium fluoride has the highest sensitivity, but it has so many false positives. So the best trade-off is the, in, in this study was gallium 68. PSMA PET scan. And uh, next slide, and this is actually more apropos to the first uh, case. Uh, this is uh, uh, what is the chance of finding metastatic disease using a gallium PET scan if you were staging, uh, in this case, 1,253 men with high risk prostate cancer? And you can see uh, uh, by PSA level, by clinical stage, and by ISOP grade of the cancer, the proportion of patients who will be found to have metastases, you know, even when the PSA is less than 10, it's 8%. Uh, if the PSA is 10 to 20, it's 15%. If it's over 20, it's 43%. And you can see by clinical stage uh, as well. And so, if I could make just one final comment, as we were talking about in the last presentation, the only thing better, in my view, in my reading on it, of, of an Axiomen scan in comparison to a PSMA scan is in the biochemical recurrence space for local recurrence. Gallium gets into the urine. You don't see smaller recurrences. Fluorinated ones do not. So right now, FACBC, much better to identify local recurrence in the biochemical recurrent patient. Do you see, quick question, do you see uh, this replacing technetium scans in the future? I would think so, yeah, most definitely. Okay. So uh, RS was started on, in quotes, ADT. And uh, so let's ask the audience, you sort of uh, already did this, uh, Tom, but uh, what would you start out? An agonist, an agonist, and an antiandrogen for two weeks before LHRH antagonist, antagonist, and an antiandrogen or other. Klotz, what, what do you do in Canada? What would your be your choice here? Well, I like D. I think the, uh, I mean, it's obviously a different story now with metastatic disease that's the androgen receptor axis target therapy as well. But if you're talking about ADT alone, uh, number D. There's there, this, this um, idea of only two weeks of antiandrogen, in my opinion, uh, did not acknowledge quite a bit of data supporting the benefit of bicalutamide, sustained bicalutamide. But we're into another era now, so that's kind of an old argument. Yeah, and I think some of the companies were, were uh, not that despairing, but before this, were using the, hey, we can save money by not using an antiandrogen that because you don't have flare. That completely blocks the whole idea of all the work we've done with combi combined androgen block A. Okay, so let's go back. That was good. Uh, so um, RS was started on an LHR agonist. And we saw in the presentation the other day, the, the first day, the, uh, the Stella's Pfizer presentation, a nice slide uh, about the fact that in spite of all these new data, over half the people were started on, uh, are on, started on a, uh, an agonist alone. So he was started on an agonist and comes to see you for second opinion two weeks later. All right, so he's only been on it two weeks. So now what would you do? Would you use docetaxel, so chemo? Would you use a third generation antiandrogen, apalutamide? Would you use abiraterone? Would you combine ADT? Uh, a, a treatment above with, with intermittent therapy? There's a whole bunch of things. Uh, David, uh, on the conventional bone scan, how many, did he have, how many bone mats? Did he have a ton of them? We might have missed that. He, he had severe disease. He had bony. It's fine. Oh, and it's and so yeah, he, had he had a lot. Yeah, he had a lot. Yeah, he's okay. high. He had a lot. Okay. So um, let me uh, ask uh, Tom, what would you what would you have done here? Uh, I would start him on the uh, chemo because I think number one, um, he's not going to be castrate at two weeks, and he needs to be treated now. It takes a month on average, and if you there was significant toxicity, which was seen in the JETOC 15 study, because the patient was not castrate 
And we're doing a trial, at the, so my answer, I have to qualify it. We're doing a trial at the moment. The reason that the, that the patient got severe toxicity is because if you give docetaxel to a non-castrate man, the liver lets in about 75 to 100 percent yeah, more. That's one of your slides later. It was, a, oh, okay. So yeah. I would, in a trial situation, we're running a trial, we now have 40 patients accrued to that trial, all high volume, and all of them are getting docetaxel prior to going on ADT. This guy's only on it for two weeks. I might be able to squeeze him into that trial. So I'm going to ask. You have to wait four weeks before the patient is rendered castrate before you give docetaxel if you're going to give it in the standard fashion. You mean the first cycle or all six cycles? No, the first cycle. Just the first. Yeah. So I'm going to I'm going to ask we're Greg doing, a, we're, a we're legal question cycles, here in a minute, but I, we're going to get going to case and it has to do with cardiovascular events. So. Let's, uh, let's talk about, you know, there's, there was all these options and people chose number, number uh, B. So Neil, uh, you've got a nice slide here. So you're going to talk about therapeutic layering. Dr. Klotz, who has done a lot of work with intermittent androgen therapy, will talk about uh, that. And then Tom mentioned that uh, taxateer stuff again. So uh, Neil, this yeah. is a slide you put together. So it's already been said here at this meeting, and I think it was even said last year, monotherapy ADT is essentially um, what I would argue is arguably malpractice. That's kind of strong. We've seen what Greg says about it. And because of the level one evidence that clearly supports couplet therapy for this man with uh, what you see up here, Dosi, Abby, Enza, Appa. And so the, 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 so I am answering my first question here that it's, it's not the standard of care. Things have changed dramatically. We know that there's still a lot of monotherapy being given. You might give monotherapy to somebody who is incredibly frail, elderly, maybe demented, uh, but you know, may, or you could argue just hospice care. Yeah. So coupled therapy is the new standard. So what, how do you make this decision? We've talked about it earlier about tumor burden, which is very important, and symptomatology of your tumor burden. I believe location is important, so I always get a CT scan. I want to know what, if they're pulmonary nodules or liver nodules. Um, and then the issue then becomes, regarding the different therapies, is cost, accessibility, there are various adverse events of interest, prednisone use, some fluid retention, heart failure, diabetes, glycemic issues for Abby. They're manageable, but you want to know about them. Enza and APA, you can argue about their AE profiles. Um, is there an optimal time to add layer and complete? I, I think there's always a good, uh, uh, starting things simultaneously, concurrently. We've seen the, 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 the folly of that. And a lot of times I like to see the patient back, give them a term to adjust to a potential flare <coughs> phenomenon and you know, flare that's either symptomatic or not and see how they're <coughs> tolerating drugs. So before I add on and I layer, I can say, I see the side effects of the ADT. Now let's go with the second couplet therapy. Okay, so the, the <coughs> couplet therapy is interesting, but you know, in every cancer that we cure, it's almost triplet therapy or, or four drugs. Is there any, any direction in adding something else while they're responding or earlier? Anybody want to comment on that? I'll comment real quickly. So, you know, you have the Enzimet trial, which essentially showed that triplet therapy uh, was not particularly successful, the ADT Enza docetexel arm, compared to using a non steroidal anti inflammatory early generation, largely by glutamide. But um, there was, in, 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 in both Arches and in Titan, you saw small, page, small subsets, wasn't really a, a planned an analysis for that, that patients with particularly high volume disease who got ADT docetexel and then went on to get treatment <coughs> actually did pretty well. But it's small numbers and it wasn't the, the, the pre-stratification for it. There's an ongoing trial right now with uh, Bayer called the, the Aracens trial which is looking at concomitant ADT docetaxel darolunamide versus ADT docetaxel. And then the other question really becomes, and I face this a lot, I'm sure many of you all do too, you finish the six cycles of docetaxel and the patient says, well, do I then sequence before I become CRPC? And the answer is, is we don't know. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Klotz, just a, a minute or two on intermittent therapy. Is this guy a candidate for it? So uh, just before I address that, uh, I would have put him on abiraterone. And I, there, first of all, there's several meta-analyses that actually show overall um, Abby prior to chemo looks like it actually gives better results in terms of survival. 
Uh, this hasn't been tested in phase three trials, but it looked pretty compelling as well. Most patients want to put off chemo. So I was a little surprised that the majority voted for chemo because I think, uh, I think most people, given the option of an androgen receptor axis targeted. I think that's what they voted for. Was Abby? Yeah, well, that was a, the androgen biosynthesis inhibitors. Okay, and, and, and so then also the there's now drugs. sequencing data. Abby before Enza is better than Enza before Abby in terms of the, what the so-called uh, secondary response, meaning the duration of time from. Yeah, but that's uh, largely sort of CRP. Here's, a, here's largely the answer CRP. here. It was, it was 48% versus 32. Good job in the back. Okay, so let, give me, give okay. me, a, give me so, one, yeah. give me so one minute. And I there's a role minute. for intermittent therapy, probably not in this patient. Okay. And this just shows the uh, 10 or so prospective randomized trials, every one of which shows either no difference or in the case of uh, improved, rather, outcome, or in the case of SWOG 9346, resolutely inconclusive. Uh, and here is our study, PR7. This is in biochemical failure. So that's really the sweet spot for intermittent therapy. But, you know, stampede, latitude, two years of uh, abiraterone, and then it was stopped. And uh, the, the patients have a complete biochemical response, according to an analysis of the SWOG9346 patients, have a median six-year uh, survival. So you do get these guys with metastatic disease. They have a complete biochemical response. Two years goes by, and although this hasn't been really tested, you know, the abiraterone ADT intermittent scenario, I think there are selected patients who probably benefit. Yeah, that's the, that's the, so PSA response to ADT is so powerful as a predictor, you've got a roughly six-fold difference in survival between the complete PSA responders put to point two and, and the non-responders above four. So this is very powerful information to predict survival, then you can modify the management accordingly. So after two months of treatment as PSA is two, and you consider treating the primary, which you sort of talked about, Tom, and, um, so what would you do, the audience? Would you use radiation to the primary, uh, a radical prostatectomy, cryotherapy, another local treatment, laser, hypo, or nothing? So it's, uh, in the Japan, it's a different situation so, uh, in the United States. So and we can use the uh, first time, uh, first line, the hormone therapy. So we can use the uh, meats uh, in these cases. So. Uh, high risk, uh, high risk disease uh, uh, meet uh, meet the uh, ratchet criteria. So, and uh, last year, the so Japanese government uh, approved the use uh, ADT and abiraterol. So, okay. first round, we recommend it to, to the ADT and abiraterol. So All right, let's yeah. go back to the slides. Uh, and Chris Kane was going to discuss this. It's already been discussed, but basically, as you know, the Stampede trial, one of them uh, looked at the, what Neil described, the subset, and there was a, an advantage for radiation uh, on overall survival and low metastatic disease burden, not in high metastatic disease burden, which this guy was. Um, I think. There's also pretty good data for the, in the cold registry about cryotherapy, which I think even is, makes a lot of sense. Uh, I'm not a fan of radical prostatectomy, so I'm, I'm pretending I'm Chris Kane right now, but I don't know if he feels that way, um, and some of the other things out there. So the other, the other question is, metastatic hormone-sensitive prostate cancer is a heterogeneous disease, and some men live more than two years, some only two years, some 15 years. Do you in the audience employ markers, any, any sort of markers? Uh, you, just showed us, we, you just showed us one, that the PSA nadir at, uh, at, uh, at uh, six months in the, in the Hussein swag study, 13 months uh, difference. So let's see what people say here. All right. So I, that's, there's a lot of education, I think, here. Next. So there are, um, there's PSA Nader, that was one, that already came up, uh, P10, P53, there's a, a whole bunch of other things out there. Um, and 
The, the other thing, there's a lot of other things in the history that better survival with uh, progression of the primary treatment versus uh, de novo metastatic disease, but that may not be true anymore <coughs> with uh, non-metastatic and using some of these uh, uh, drugs earlier. Spartan trials showed some, some data with Decipher, uh, DNA repair genes, but I think one of the important things are, are and we're going to talk up some more about this uh, in, the, in the meeting, is uh, germline testing and things like that and somatic acquired mutations. So he's treated with ADT and a third generation antiandrogen um, for uh, 2.5 years his P uh, uh, and his PSA is undetectable. And now uh, we want to talk about uh, use, uh, what if he had prior MACE and that's, uh, I think Tom you pretty much already talked about yeah. that so we'll save some time. You talked about the Margell trial. Yeah. Uh, which, uh, and, and this one here also, but um, I want to ask Greg Pache this as a lawyer, is, you know, we would not have television in Denver if it wasn't for plaintiff's lawyers, the way I look at it, uh, and we know you're not a plaintiff's lawyer, but um, the, there's, there's pretty good evidence right now that men that go on androgen deprivation therapy to lower their testosterone, that it increases their risk of cardiovascular disease, uh, including heart attacks and strokes and things like that. Um, and then if you have pre-existing disease, um, that it, it, it's accelerated and, it, and it's double and it may depend on the agent. And you know, personally, I think I've bumped off a mayor and a governor in this state um, that, that this one of the buildings is named after. When they, they were in their 70s and 80s, and they had rising PSAs, I put them on ADT, they were happy, the PSAs went down, uh, but about six months later they had a heart attack and died. So what's, what, what's, we're just surprised that the, the legal profession hasn't jumped on this. What's, what are your thoughts about it? It will. <laughs> but I'm surprised that they haven't yet. Keep talking like that, they will. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, has anybody seen a lawsuit? With, with ADT yet? And the other ones, the other one are fractures and I mean things. Now we're, these things have a lot of side effects. So what do you do when a, this person becomes uh, metastatic castrate resistant disease, Neil, when a word or two? Maybe we've only got a couple minutes left, so. So, so, so real quickly, NCCN guidelines suggest medis this patient should get um, uh, both uh, uh, hereditary prostate cancer and somatic and germline testing. Uh, I do it now routinely in all of my patients for the reasons that uh, some of the markers that you show up, the DNA al uh, aberrations, alterations uh, are particularly important. We have an, a, a, an approved drug in pembrolizumab for this patient if he's in that one to two percent that has MSI high and the responses are rather remarkable. If he is uh, in the HRR panel, particularly most predominant being BRCA2, we're really on the cusp in the next, uh, in 2020, we're going to see PARP approved drugs. So you'd want to know about that. Uh, in terms of him being on ADT plus an, uh, a third generation uh, novel hormonal agent, that's the $64 question. What becomes the next line of therapy when he's MCRPC? Um, I would probably also look, if, this, uh, if, I, if I was concerned about him being poorly differentiated, small cell neuroendocrine differentiated, I look at getting chromogran and A, I get a CTC levels as well. Then you're left at sort of still dealer's choice when he goes to MCRPC. Uh, as, uh, as Laurie alluded to, the switch, and there's been a lot of data going from one oral third generation to another, is not a great strategy, although ABI to uh, uh, an AR inhibitor is usually much, a little bit better than going AR inhibitor to ABI. You're looking at docetaxel, you're looking at radium-223, you're looking at uh, Sepulis cell T, and you're looking at taxane-based therapy. Do you uh, uh, get an ARV7 on this person when they get to this level? So I don't routinely. Okay. So um, let me ask, uh, we, we've got uh, six minutes left. Let me ask Dr. Hirano, anything different than Japan that you're doing? Yeah, this is a uh, first-line treatment approved by Japanese Minister of Health and Wellness for or metastatic or hormone sensitivity birth cancer. And uh, we have lots, lots of med uh, items, so, but uh, only, so this, in these cases, I, uh, I previously mentioned the 
or this case meets the criteria of our attitude. So on the first, first round, we recommend to uh, uh, ADT and Abiratero. Okay, so, so and also, so uh, he, he had a met metastasis, bone metastasis, so anti uh, uh, or denosomes or uh, bisohosne, uh, we, we both, uh, both treatment is. Uh, you don't have the same menu we do, but maybe this is probably uh, music uh, to Dr. Glaude's ears here, the uh, yeah. eyes using estromustine and estrogens and things like that. He's yeah. done a lot of that. Yeah, but, but uh, these are old, old medicines. So most of the, uh, now, so we, we use uh, uh, LH, RH agonist or antagonist, and also first lines, the first model, big and Okay. Yeah. So do uh, okay. you want to just mention, go over this, uh, some of the side effects of ADT? This is a great slide. That, uh, well, this, this is a whole lecture, but the idea, the, the, the basic message is that if you put patients on ADT, you need to become mm -hmm. the primary care physician for that patient because there's a whole host of side effects that can be managed and treated, and the primary care physicians, by and large, aren't aware of these things and don't do them. So A, B, C, D, E, F. The A, I'll try and get through this in one minute. The A is for awareness, low-dose aspirin. These patients are at risk. There are a whole, there's at least two randomized trials, one of which I did, of aledronate versus placebo in men on ADT. And rather than loss of bone mineral density, you actually get gain of bone mineral density. It's one pill a week. Why this isn't more widely utilized, I don't know. Vitamin D and calcium has never been shown to have any benefit, although that's the standard of care. Statins, lots of data, epidemiologic, and uh, showing that men on statins have a lower risk of progression of prostate cancer, lower uh, mortality rate, smoking sensation, the single most cost-effective intervention in all of medicine, diet, we've heard about that, dementia, there's a whole bunch of data about this recently. Um, as far as diabetes, they get insulin resistance and uh, <clears throat> Uh, and elevated glucose. There's two randomized trials in men on ADT showing that low-dose metformin reduces weight gain, reduces insulin and glucose levels, reduces uh, 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 waist circumference, and again, these have been neglected. I think there's a role for, for metformin relatively routinely in these patients. They don't get hypoglycemia if they're not diabetic exercise we heard about and the whole story of the That's re number one. reduced cardiovascular, well, E is number five, but still, in terms of priority. And then Firmagon for the men who have pre-existing uh, cardiovascular disease based on what we heard about earlier. All right. I want to just end up uh, with about uh, two minutes. Jim, can you, uh, you want to do the NCCN stuff? Yeah. So uh, this is where this uh, patient fits in the guideline. He has needs systemic therapy for castration-naive disease, and the first thing you do is ask, is it high or low volume? And in this particular situation, we would uh, rec favor docetaxel, although not recommend it, just favor it because of the high volume disease. And then you should consider treatment the primary, which was brought up only in, right now the data supports only in low volume disease, and that e even that is controversial. So next slide. So then it was brought up that you should germline sequence all men with metastatic disease. Now, that is not an option. That's what you're supposed to do for the reasons that Neil very uh, succinctly described. And then next, click it again. And you should also consider doing somatic sequencing because this person is soon going to be uh, requiring an adjustment in therapy. And the, tr the decision is, do you biopsy something now? It's probably better to wait and biopsy it when you're going to need the change in therapy. Uh, and this is also the reason to get the CT scan that was debated before, because it's much easier to biopsy and, and get sequence off a soft tissue lesion. So you want a lung or liver met, not a bone met to biopsy. Next. And so uh, now the question is intermittent or continuous, and I think we are really guilty of 
giving too much continuous ADT, especially when the PSA goes down next to nothing like Lori showed. These men are going to be off ADT for several years, and especially with the expense of the secondary ADTs, um, this is very valuable. So there's still no good data that continuous works better than intermittent with the possible exception of somebody with high volume disease that presents symptomatically, symptomatic high volume bone nets. Other than that, you cannot justify continuous ADT, period. Okay. Well, I want to I thank everybody. That was very good.